words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I'm going to be talking about um, some different ways in which God is hidden. And um, I think probably a lot of us have experienced some sense of the hiddenness of God, whether that be through um, unanswered prayer or um, a lack of an experience of his felt presence. So I think the question, um, why is God hidden, is a question that strikes many people as um, an important question. It's a pressing question for us. And I think that even as uh, Christians, we resonate with this thought that God is hidden, even if we think he's only partially hidden rather than fully hidden. So there's many different ways God can be hidden, but the way in which God is hidden in the particular um, philosophical literature and the philosophical argument that I'm going to be looking at today uh, is, a, is a just one specific kind of hiddenness. And this is a kind of hiddenness that is directly related to the evidence that we have for God's existence. So the idea is that his existence, the fact of his existence, is hidden from people. So it's a little bit different than the way um, some of these other ways we might think about hiddenness. And the thought is that um, there's a kind of poverty to our evidential situation with respect to God. And that if a God exists who loves us, we wouldn't be in this kind of evidential situation. He would have given us more evidence or stronger evidence. Um, our evidential situation would look different than it is if there's a loving God who wants relationship with us. So that's just a rough sketch of um, the angle at, from which philosophers are approaching what they call divine hiddenness. And I have a couple goals in this talk. First, I want to try to clarify the argument. Most of my talk will be directed at trying to clarify what the argument is. Um, and specifically within that, I want to challenge an assumption that's usually assumed in this literature. So I want to challenge the assumption that if God makes available adequate evidence for belief that he exists, um, that this is inconsistent with the existence of non-culpable non-believers. And I'll talk about what I mean by that in a second. So I want to clarify the argument, and then I will um, conclude by drawing our attention to some of the analogies that are used in this literature to talk about God's hiddenness. And I want to suggest that the analogy of glimpses is more apt than some of the other analogies currently being used. Okay, so first um, I'm going to introduce the argument. So it's a short argument. Um, I'm using a um, simplified version of the argument and it's on your handout. So this is taken from um, uh, a longer version of the argument that comes from um, a philosopher named J.L. Schellenberg. So the argument is this, premise one, if a loving God exists and there are no, sorry, then there are no non-resistant non-believers. Premise two, there are non-resistant non-believers and conclusion, no loving God exists. So in this context, non-resistant non-belief is often equated with inculpable non-belief. So it's supposed to be characteristic of those who lack belief in God through no fault of their own. So non-culpable non-belief is contrasted with culpable non-belief. And culpable non-believers resist the evidence in some way. So they're often thought of as um, people who are um, sort of clenching their eyes shut in order to resist the evidence. 
So the existence of non-resistant or non-culpable non-believers raises a problem because it is thought that a loving God would provide or make available sufficient evidence of his existence to all who want to believe. So that anyone who is not clenching their eyes shut, who is not resisting, would um, have evidence that he exists, be in a position to know that he exists. And there are a variety of ways that philosophers have responded to this argument. Some replies involve rejection of premise two. So that is to um, reject the premise that there are people in this category, that there are non-resistant non-believers. Um, people who take this strategy um, deny that non-resistant non non-believers exist and thus claim that everyone who doesn't believe in God is resisting the evidence. So then we would just have two categories. We would have believers and then we would have culpable non-believers, non-believers who resist the evidence rather than this third category of non-resistant non-believers. Um, so that's one strategy for responding to the argument. Other replies involve rejection of premise one, that if a loving God exists, there are no non-resistant non-believers. And this strategy generally proceeds um, by thinking of reasons God might have for permitting non-resistant non-belief. So if God, if, if non-resistant non-belief is an, a, a sort of unfortunate state of affairs, maybe God would have a good reason for not giving some people evidence or not giving them evidence right now. Maybe he'll give it to them later. Um, um, but usually rejection of premise one involves some sort of reason for God um, to either um, not give the evidence or um, permit uh, non-reasonable non-belief. And I think this work is important, both of these strategies for responding to the argument. Um, but in this talk, um, I'm not going to contribute to either of these two strategies. Instead, I want to advance a different route for rejecting premise one. So it's usually assumed that if non-resistant non-believers exist, it's because God has not provided or made available sufficient evidence for belief. So Schellenberg claims that a non-resistant non-believer will always be, quote, in a position to participate in relationship with God, able to do so just by trying insofar as they are non-resistant, to be in a position to be in relationship with him. Where in a position to relate to God personally is something that would be in their power to do just by choosing. So God would have done his part, and now it's, it's on them to, to respond. So the idea is that if God makes evidence of his existence available, <clears throat> and these people have their eyes open, then they're in a position to believe in God. So in this way, the reasoning of one can be unpacked um, as follows, and this is four and five on your handout. So four says, if God exists, then he provides or makes available adequate evidence of his existence. And five says, if God provides or makes available adequate evidence of his existence, then there are no non-resistant non-believers. And I want to argue that on some plausible understanding of provides adequate evidence, five is false. That is, I want to suggest that non-culpable non-belief is compatible with God's providing or making available sufficient evidence for his existence. Now, two questions Natural, naturally arise when we look at the suggestion that God has not provided adequate evidence for his existence. The first is, what exactly is God obligated to do that he hasn't? And the second is, what's wrong with our evidential situation? 
And discussions of the problem of hiddenness are generally not very clear on the answers to these questions, or even what an adequate answer to these questions would be. So consider these statements also from Schellenberg of what we would expect a loving God to do. Um, I think these, yeah, these are on your handout also. So he says, God would make conscious awareness of the divine available to every finite personal creature capable of experiencing it. This is from The Wisdom to Doubt. Um, and he says, if God exists and is perfectly loving, humans will be given access to evidence sufficient for belief in God's existence. And without further explanation, or much further explanation, of what this availability might look like, Schellenberg states that just by looking around with our eyes open, we can see that this state of affairs does not actually obtain. So I want to suggest that in order to determine whether adequate evidence has been provided, we need to better understand what it is to provide evidence to someone. And at first glance, this might seem fairly straightforward. And in, in fact, given the way that this notion is used in the literature, um, it'd be easy to get the impression that we all have a pretty good idea of what it is to provide someone with evidence. Um, but under scrutiny, it's not so straightforward. In The Wisdom to Doubt, Schellenberg identifies and describes various ways evidence might go unrecognized by us. And among these are the following categories. Overlooked evidence. So sometimes evidence is missed, even though it's accessible. So this could be due to um, distractions or interruptions. Um, maybe you have um, told me something, but I just didn't hear you because I wasn't paying attention. Or you've written something down. Um, you've written it on a, in a letter and you've handed it to me, but I just haven't gotten around to reading it yet. Um, this would be overlooked evidence. Um, it would be evidence that in some sense you have, but you haven't taken account of yet. So this is not, Schellenberg thinks, the kind of evidence that we're talking about when we talk about the problem of divine hiddenness. And the reason is that he thinks non-resistant non-believers are a group of individuals who have already given sufficient attention to the evidence. They, um, they've, they've already looked, they've, they've, you know, they've done the equivalent of reading the letters. They, they have all of the evidence available to them. They haven't overlooked any of it. So he rules out the idea that God provides evidence, but we overlook it. And it's worth noting that I think this, it's not at all obvious what exactly counts in this category. So it's not exactly obvious what counts as giving sufficient attention to some, um, some bit of evidence. We might wonder, how easy does it need to be to take into account or appreciate the evidence? I mean, if you've written me a note, but um, you wrote it in Chinese, and you know I don't, I don't read Chinese, then there's some sense perhaps, in, in which you've provided me with the evidence. Um, but it doesn't seem like it's evidence that I've overlooked, given that I don't read Chinese. So I think that this category may have been dismissed a bit too quickly. Um, but my concern lies, lies elsewhere, so um, I'll just note this and move on. Another category Schellenberg delineates um, is as follows, neglected evidence. This evidence is accessible, and the failure to recognize it is avoidable. So perhaps I was lazy. Um, uh, it's my fault that I don't have the evidence. Um, maybe I was involved in some form of uh, culpable self-deception with respect to the evidence. So I should have been more attentive. What you were telling me was important. It's my fault that I didn't hear it. So here the evidence is available, and the recipient or the agent um, that is being given to is culpable for not taking it into account. So this would be the category of culpable non-believers 
this is a category that Schellenberg and others in the, the discussion agree exists. It's not the category that is sort of up for, up for grabs or up for debate with respect to the argument. And then lastly, there's the category of inaccessible evidence. And this is evidence that has not yet been discovered. So for example, um, if God gave us some evidence, but he put it in a cave, and no one's ever even been you know, near that cave, this would be inaccessible evidence. So it would be in principle possible to um, uncover it. And if we uncovered it, we would recognize it as evidence, but we just haven't found it yet. Um, so these are some different options for the ways that um, we could categorize or think about evidence. And these options seem to me to fail to fully describe our evidential position with respect to God. And in particular, it seems to fail to describe the group that Schellenberg is most interested in, that of former believers. I think former believers don't fall into really any um, of these categories with respect to the evidence. So former believers for Schellenberg display the most disturbing type of non-belief. This is the non-belief of those who regret the loss of their belief. They wish to regain it, but feel unable to do so. Um, Schellenberg asks us to imagine individuals who start out assured of the power and presence of God in their lives, and then they lose all this often by being exposed to reasons for doubt about the reliability of the support they have for theistic belief. So I want to suggest that we need another category. And I call this category defeated evidence. So the problem is that it's often assumed that if the evidence is available and the agent is not in willful resistance, that the agent will believe that God exists. But I think there's a plausible understanding of available evidence on which this is not the case. So I think God could provide evidence, evidence which on its own would be sufficient for belief, but an agent might also possess defeaters that make agnosticism rational for them, despite this availability of evidence. And one, one thing that this points out about um, the current state of the literature on this problem is that this dichotomy of either cul culpable resistance or um, not enough evidence seems incorrect. So it doesn't seem to be a very good description of our evidential state or our evidential situation. Our epistemic situation is more complicated than this. So consider the following case where under normal circumstances, we might take the evidence provided as a paradigm example of adequate evidence. So suppose that um, I have a red mug and I want you to know that I have a red mug. Um, suppose I'm you know, holding it behind my back. One thing that I could do is I could tell you that I have a red mug. Um, another thing I could do is I could um, hold out the mug and place it on the table in front of me. Um, and we might think in, in ordinary circumstances, this is, a, this is a great example of providing you with evidence that I have um, a red mug and providing you with sufficient evidence. But then consider that we introduce what epistemologists call defeating evidence. Um, so we'll alter the case like this. Same case, I have a red mug, I place it in front of me um, on the table, you can, you can all see it. Uh, but you've been convinced that uh, the room is fixed with trick lighting, and this lighting makes objects that aren't red look red. Most epistemologists um, think that you then have a defeater for the belief that the mug is red. <clears throat> So if you were to continue that, to believe that the mug is red, 
they think your belief would fail to be rational, given that you believe that the room is fixed with trick lighting. So here we have um, the presence of evidence normally sufficient to make belief rational, plus some misleading evidence. And one point I want to draw attention to is that this situation seems to clearly differ from a situation where I don't give you any evidence at all, where we have a mere absence of evidence. So this is a case of mixed evidence, not of mere absence of evidence. So it's very different from a situation where I neither tell you nor show you um, the mug. So there's some clear sense um, in that second situation that I, that I have provided you with evidence that I have a red mug. But we could ask a few questions about this case. Have I provided you with sufficient evidence that there is a cup that's red? Are you culpable for not believing that the cup is red? Are you in a position to rationally believe or know that the cup is red? Are you in the presence of evidence sufficient for belief? It's difficult to answer these questions when one's evidential situation involves defeaters. It's not immediately obvious that you're not in a position to believe that the cup is red or that I haven't provided adequate evidence. I think we certainly can't determine that just by looking around with our eyes open. But it also seems clear that should you fail to believe that the cup is red, your belief is not due to mere um, willful resistance of the evidence. So the problem is not that you're clenching your eyes shut in that kind of case. Now, I don't take these considerations to refute the hiddenness argument, but rather to call for clarification. So a few points to draw from this. First, I think we need a better understanding of the notion of providing or making available evidence. And I think the, the discussions of this problem are suffering um, due to a lack of clarity on this notion. Second, um, if, what I, if what I'm saying is right, we can't reason from non-culpable non-believers and conclude or infer the absence of adequate evidence for God's existence. At least this inference isn't warranted without further argumentation. And third, there's a significant difference in the evidential situation where one fails to have any evidence, which taken on its own would make a proposition probable, and an evidential situation where one has evidence for P, but that evidence is combined with some misleading evidence or some defeaters of that evidence. And I think that the latter situation makes something along the lines of a free will defense plausible. So current explanations of the hiddenness problem place the blame either on God for not providing enough evidence or on the non-believer for culpable resistance of the evidence. And I think focus on defeated evidence can introduce a third option, that a third party has misled the non-believer. So in this way, the free will defense is relevant to the problem of divine hiddenness. Just as the free will of agents can contribute to an explanation for why God allows at least some of the evil in the world, the free will of agents can explain the introduction of certain defeaters and thus contribute to an explanation of divine hiddenness. So I don't think that um, the free will of agents will explain every case of defeated evidence, um, but uh, insofar as uh, human agents are responsible for um, large degrees or amounts of evil in the world, and uh, a lot of, for a lot of people, evil um, constitutes some evidence against God or some sort of defeater. 
um, for some of their evidence. I think that um, we can think of the free will defense as contributing to a solution to this problem. Um, or, for example, another, another way to think about it is that um, someone has a religious experience of God, but then they're convinced um, by some authority figure, perhaps, that they shouldn't trust their religious experience, and, and, they, and they believe that authority figure. And so the um, evidence that they're given from God um, uh, suffers defeat due to their lack of, of belief that religious experience is reliable. So I think it would be helpful to introduce um, uh, this way of thinking about the argument. Now, what I want to do next is look at how we might uh, fix the argument, given some of the things that I've said here. So there are many different ways to understand the, the claim that God is hidden. If hidden is taken as synonymous with God has not provided adequate evidence, then what I've shown is that the existence of non-culpable non-believers is not enough to conclude that God is hidden. Now, a somewhat natural way to fix the argument might be to suggest that despite the availability of evidence for belief, there's still something inadequate about our evidential situation. There's still something impoverished about um, <clears throat> our evidential situation and impoverished in a way that a loving God would not permit. So we can ask again, what's wrong with our evidential situation? Well, one option is to argue that a loving God would not only provide adequate evidence, but he would provide um, sufficient evidence where we understand sufficient as providing adequate evidence plus defeater defeaters. And I think initially this seems to be a really plausible reply or a plausible way to fix the argument in light of what I've just said. But note that this makes the argument more difficult to advance because it makes what is required of God more demanding. So it might be easy to get on board with the idea that God ought to provide adequate evidence when doing so seems minimal or easy. But once we introduce a requirement for uh, God to defeat defeaters of each agent, then the demand for evidence will be raised significantly. So one important question we might ask um, is, is God required to defeat every defeater that anyone has? Is he obligated to make everyone's total evidence um, point to him or point to uh, his existence? Is he, is he required to do so in a way that's obvious to each agent, in a way that they can see that their evidence points towards him? Um, we might wonder whether uh, the following statement better captures what the ad advocates of the argument um, are suggesting that we expect of God, if this, if this is the case. So here, this is um, six on your handout. If a loving God exists, he provides each person with evidence that defeats each defeater that that person has. Maybe this is how the argument should go. I have two worries about revising the argument in this way. One worry is that this version of the argument will strike some as less intuitive than the original argument. And another worry is that there will be no limit to the amount of evidence that God must provide. So note that it's not clear what minimally I can do to get you to believe that the cup I've placed <clears throat> on the table is red once you believe that the room has trick lighting. Schellenberg often uses language that makes it seem that he thinks a loving God <coughs> would do whatever he can 
to ensure belief of those seeking belief. So this suggests a stronger requirement than mere adequate evidence. Um, but at the same time, Schellenberg maintains that he's not asking for much, nothing extreme, no compelling proofs or wondrous signs. He doesn't think that God needs to make his existence obvious, to sort of spell it out in the clouds. He thinks he needs to provide just enough evidence for belief to make belief rational. So he states that reflection on the nature of love does not suggest reasons for God to provide us with some incontrovertible proof or overwhelm us with a display of divine glory. Rather, what a loving God has reason to do is provide us with evidence sufficient for belief. So, so Schellenberg, who's the primary advocate of this argument, seems to um, want to have it that there's something God's required to do, but it's not something really extravagant. It's, it's something um, somewhat minimal and somewhat easy. And I think it's easier to get on board with the argument when it's presented in that way. You might think, yeah, that sounds right. Why wouldn't God at least give us evidence that would make belief rational? Um, but uh, some of the things I've been saying are, I think, are pushing the argument towards this stronger version, where he would be required to defeat defeaters or where he would be required to put us in a position to know that he exists, not just believe. So I think that advocates of the argument suggest that they have something um, less in mind than the stronger version. <clears throat> and I think that there's um, also some cost to advancing the argument in the way that I've been suggesting it should be advanced, um, because more is required of God. Um, and another issue concerns whether there in fact is some amount or kind of evidence that God could provide um, that would defeat all defeaters, make belief that he exists rational, but do so without placing all agents in a position to know that he exists. <clears throat> so we might wonder whether we could avoid construing the central premise of the problem of hiddenness in the following way. If a loving God exists, he would place each person in a position to know that he exists. So I think the line of thought from the last section leads the argument in this direction, but I suspect that the advocates of the argument would be unhappy with this construal of the argument. So the challenge is to set it up in such a way that it doesn't require God to put us all in a position to know that he exists, but nevertheless requires a great deal of evidence. Now, regardless of whether God is obligated to provide everyone with defeater defeaters, we might think that it seems like a good idea, um, that it would be better if we had defeater defeaters. It would be better if we had more evidence. Um, and so I think it still makes sense for us to look for an explanation for why we don't have stronger evidence than we do, why we don't have a stronger evidential situation with respect to God. Um, but um, I don't know that that explanation or those reasons are forthcoming. Um, so I, I like to, with respect to, to both this and the problem of evil, I like to make a distinction between the why questions. <clears throat> why did God allow that? Why didn't he give us more evidence? And the evidential questions of what does our actual evidence point towards? Um, does it... Does it indicate that there's a God? Does it indicate that there's not a God? This is a separate question from the why question, and the one doesn't answer the other. Um, so there's a number of analogies uh, to our evidential situation that are discussed in the divine hiddenness literature. Uh, and these are analogies that attempt to portray what God is like in relation to us. So Schellenberg, the primary advocate of this argument, um, often casts um, God as a bad parent. So he offers a picture where um, there's a child, um, maybe in the forest, crying, looking for their parent, um, and um, the parent is just nowhere to be found. And he thinks that um, this depicts analogously our evidential situation with God. We're looking for him, we need him, we're crying, we're like children, and um, he 
um, and he refuses to uh, speak or to reach out to us. And so in this way, he's like a bad parent. Um, but those on the opposing side often portray um, culpable non-believers as analogous to people who are very stubborn and they're clenching their eyes shut and they just refuse to even open their eyes to see what um, is sometimes suggested. It would just be obvious to them if they would just open their eyes. The analogies that we use to discuss this issue are important. Um, they prime us to see the argument in certain ways, in a certain light, and they often serve as aids in making the argument more or less persuasive. So when we focus on the bad parent analogy, I think we're more inclined to affirm premise one. But by contrast, if we think that uh, non-believers are all clenching their eyes shut, um, and that getting evidence for God's existence is as easy as opening your eyes, then it makes it much easier to deny premise two, that there are non-resistant non-believers. But each of these depictions neglects an important aspect of the debate, um, namely that our evidence is more complicated than this. So note that the situation of defeated evidence is not captured by either of these images particularly well. If, in fact, the evidential situation of many is mixed, <clears throat> I think our analogies ought to reflect this fact. So in this way, some of the analogies in the literature fall short. Uh, and I want to suggest that we focus on a different set of analogies. So here I'll put forward, just by way of conclusion, um, an image type that strikes me as more adequate to the task of representing our evidential situation. Um, so this kind of image seems at least to better depict the situation of former believers um, or those who have had some kind of religious experience. So consider glimpses. Glimpses provide the viewer with a partial vision, sometimes a glance. Um, glimpses are often momentary and they are usually not available on demand or at all times. One feature of this kind of evidence is that in many cases, it's easy to defeat. That is, while sometimes a glimpse is sufficient, given one's background knowledge, to draw a conclusion, it can also be outweighed by counter evidence, and sometimes very easily. So glimpses seem to better fit or to represent our evidential situation to me for two reasons. First, they concede that the evidence is not so clear as to make it obvious that God exists. And second, unlike the image of a silent God as a bad parent, they represent God as having made some effort to reveal himself, while leaving it open whether he is obligated to give us more than a glimpse. So I don't mean to suggest that the analogy of glimpses will resolve the hiddenness debate, there is still ample room for disagreement regarding when glimpses constitute sufficient evidence and under what circumstances glimpses are defeated. Although representing our evidential situation as similar to glimpses will not resolve the issue, I think still this image is a more accurate representation of the complexity of our situation than many analogies in the literature. And a potential result of refocusing the central analogy of the problem of hiddenness to that of glimpses is that theists can agree that our evidential situation could be stronger than it is without losing sight of the important point that it is not as though we have no evidence that points towards God. There is evidence for God's existence, even if that evidence is not as strong as we might have expected to receive if there's a loving God. And the question remains whether such glimpses are enough. Thank you.